Yeah. And there is an opportunity cost, unquestionably. And uh, we've had a, a bunch of questions here. I suspect this will be a, a fairly quick answer, but about uh, VTSEX versus the ETF version, which is VTI. Uh, Elizabeth said, I spoke to a Vanguard, advi Vanguard advisor yesterday, and he recommended the ETF version of VTS, VTSAX versus VTSAX itself. He said it has a lower fee. What are your thoughts generally on why you would recommend one or the other, or are they substantially similar in your opinion? Yeah, so I, I have a post on this and I'll, I'll, I'll let people go to the post for details, but it's, they, they are for all practical purposes the same. Uh, I'm in VTSAX, I suppose, primarily because when I started investing in it, ETFs weren't around. Uh, but VTI holds precisely the same portfolio. It does have a slightly lower expense ratio. The difference in that isn't enough to make your choice for you, but yeah, just just like buying a total stock market index fund from somebody other than Vanguard is fine, buying the VTF uh, version is fine as well. You're yeah. buying the same, essentially the same thing. Well, may I add, as a uh, layman without a blog, is that <laughs> that doesn't I'm make you a layman. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so I actually prefer the mutual fund because I don't like having money set on the side. And every other than like having a robo advisor like Betterment, uh, my ability to fractionally uh, purchase fractional shares of an ETF is minimal. You know, you usually have to through Vanguard buy a whole share. And unless that's changed recently, that's one of the reasons why I stuck with the mutual fund version is that it allows me to get the market money in the market faster. So, you know. That, that's my reasoning versus setting yeah. it in, in the holding account until I had a full share's worth. Yeah, that's one of the things I talk about in that, that post. But, but again, fractional, that's a fairly minor thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, Yeah, I think know, a share is under $100 of VTI or somewhere right in that vicinity. So. Yeah, yeah. something but, like that. Yeah, that's so, all. Cool. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, <laughs> if you're comfortable with the mutual fund, then do the mutual fund. If you're yep. comfortable with the ETF, then do the ETF. There are more important things to spend our time worrying yep. about. Yeah. <laughs> Amanda asked a question about, about cash and about mm -hmm. how much, how many months uh, she's talking about in COVID times, but, but I think just generally, let, let's make this broader. Do you keep a certain amount of money in cash uh, for a certain X number of months of living expenses? Do you subscribe to those type of theories? How, how would you talk through that? So this is one of those things where, where uh, I'm not opposed to it. I've never particularly kept large amounts of, of cash around because, again, the volatility doesn't concern me as much. Uh, I recognize that when the market, if I'm living off the portfolio and the market plunges, uh, I'm going to get a little better than 2% of what I need just from dividends and interest and the other 2% from selling shares. And if I have to sell those shares for a few years while they're down, that's just not that big a deal to me. Uh, so I've typically only kept as much cash on hand as I need to, to pay my routine bills. Um, if somebody says, well, I want to keep more than that. I want to keep three months or six months or three years. And there are all kinds of things out there. That's fine. But again, you're serving your psychology rather than the math. Uh, the math would indicate that the market's much more likely to go up over any given period of time. Uh, but again, if it ha helps you sleep at night, then by all means, feel free to do it. What would mm -hmm. compel you to consider international funds? So uh, I, I think let's, let's start with the fact that I've never been opposed to having inter international funds in the portfolio. I just don't see the need for it. And I still don't see the need for it. And again, I have a post on this that goes into some detail as to why that is. But to answer this question very specifically, I think about as to when I might change that. And I don't, I don't anticipate changing my portfolio anytime in the near future, to be clear. Um, I probably don't have to in my lifetime, but I talked to my daughter about this because she might want to do it in her much longer lifetime. So think about it this way. We come out of World War II 
And every industrialized country in the world, other than the United States, is literally in ashes. I mean, literally bombed into ashes. And so not surprisingly, the world economy at the time is essentially the United States. The world economic pie is almost 100% the US. And then, of course, the rest of the world begins to build. And two things happen as the rest of the world begins to build. And by the way, the United States played a key role in helping the rest of the world build, rebuild is the pie itself begins to get bigger and bigger as those other economies get back on their feet. But by definition, as they get back on their feet and stronger, the share of the pie that the U.S. represents begins to drop from close to 100%. And now, as we sit here today, it's somewhere around 50%. So, And I'm probably not exactly right about that. But it's about 50%. With a little bit of, of... of limited analysis, you might look at that and say, wow, that's terrible. We've gone from almost 100 to 50%. But you have to understand that it is a far bigger pie. So this is not only good for the United States, it's good for the rest of the world who's, you know, growing and participating actively in the market. I see that continuing. I think the rest of the world, and of course, what we used to call third world countries are beginning to blossom with their economies. So they'll be getting a bigger and bigger share of this pie. And in the process, making the pie itself bigger and bigger. And so the U.S. will have a smaller percentage of of it and yet a bigger and bigger economy from it. So good for the U.S. But at some point, uh, the U.S. share will be too small to want to focus only on the U.S. market. It's the same reason that I don't recommend any other residents of any other country buy only their own market. I certainly don't recommend Canadians buy only Canadian stocks. Their share of the pie is simply too small. The same thing with with the UK, the same thing with Germany, the same thing with France, the same thing with Australia. Great economies, but the share of the pie is just too small and too limited. Uh, The U.S. is the only economy that's large enough where you can get away with owning only the U.S. economy. But the trend, assuming the world market, the world continues to grow and expand and get better and better as it has over the decades, uh, our share is going to get smaller and smaller. And at some point, investors like my daughter are probably going to want to own the entire world. And in fact, when I'm talking to international audiences, uh, if I were a resident of any other country, I'd probably already be owning the rest of the world. It's not a bad step to take now. I just don't think for those of us in the U.S., it's a necessary step yet. 